Hello everyone, welcome to video number two of this lecture on extinctions and in this video we're going to be looking at mass extinctions. So we'll quickly have a look at what these are and how we know about them. We'll uh, define a few terms that are useful for us when we're dealing with mass extinctions and we'll finish with what I think is a very important lesson that will serve you well both in this module, throughout your career and indeed in life. So you know, um, I'm, I'm selling it, but I think that's probably fairly accurate. So without further ado, let's have a quick look at mass extinctions. So the idea that there is more structure to extinction than just a random process going on in the background um, has bubbled along since Cuvier's time. So if you remember the idea of catastrophism, that's a, a flavor of this idea that m possibly there could be some kind of structure to the extinction that's happening and has happened over geological history. Um, we've actually been able to look at the patterns of extinction far better in recent years than Cuvier was able to back then. Uh, we'll have more on this in our paleoecology lectures and indeed the potential biases at play. But essentially, um, the more fossils we have and the more paleontologists there are describing those fossils, the easier it is to identify patterns because we can get more records of past life to actually analyze. A key name in all of this is Jack, Jack Sepkowski. So he is a man that created graphs that show global history of diversity through successive intervals of geological time. So for example, you count the number of families that may be present in each time period um, in the fossil record. And that an example of this is called a Sepkowski curve is shown on this page here. And if we do that, we can identify several patterns. So Sepkowski, when he first did this, identified three different major faunas, the Cambrian fauna, that then struggled on and died out in the um, Devonian Carboniferous, the Paleozoic fauna, and then the modern fauna. So all of this was done by looking at what families, what groups were in the fossil record, counting those up, um, I guess identifying which one of these faunas they belong to, and then plotting that on a graph. So Sepkowski, uh, over the course of, um, I think, 10, 15 years, in fact, did this at both family and genus level. And because he was able to um, do quantitative analysis, he showed robustly that, amongst other things, there seemed to be periods of pulsed extinctions. So these are periods um, which are marked on the, li the with uh, red dashed lines on this graph. These seem to be um, fairly large dips in the diversity of families that we see in the fossil record. So some obvious uncertainties uh, surround this, for example, the um, dates of fossil taxa, and there are a multitude of biases at play. Um, for example, the amount of rock that we have from each of these given periods will define how many fossils that we find. But despite this, and this is true across databases, not just Sepkowski's, um, we find a pattern of major um, blips, major pulses of extinction occurring throughout the Phanerozoic, so throughout the period that you see here. So let's dig a little deeper into that and see if we can spot any patterns. Well, the picture is that we have pulses in extinction. And once these pulses reach a certain size, we tend to call these mass extinctions. As that description would imply, um, actually defining a mass extinction is quite tricky because there are different magnitudes of extinction pulses occurring at different times. Um, and indeed, given that no single event um, is identical, um, we have to um, essentially place things into a, a fairly arbitrary binary box of mass extinction versus not, which is useful to our understanding of the history of life, but isn't necessarily correct. One definition for a mass extinction that attempts to do this is shown on the slide. This is a, um, it says a, a mass extinction is a catastrophic widespread event in which a large proportion, brackets up to 90%, of species become extinct in a relatively short time compared with normal background extinction. So in other words, it's a elevated range or rate of extinction with um, fairly large side effects. Um, 
more broadly and perhaps more usefully, we can define mass extinctions as sharing a number of common factors, which I will now list. The first is that for something to be considered a mass extinction, for that to be a useful term, we will have to say that many species become extinct, perhaps more than 30% of plants and animals at the time. If it's not, you're not looking at mass extinction. The extinct organisms should span a broad range of ecologies and typically include marine and non-marine forms, at least once you have non-marine life. We'll be learning about that in the final lecture of this course. Um, and it should cover, for example, plants and animals, microscopic and large forms. So the impact of this event should be widespread across the tree of life. Um, the extinction should be worldwide and cover most continents and ocean basins. It should all happen within a relatively short time period and hence relate to a single cause or a cluster of interlinked causes. Um, so a good example of a potential cause for mass extinction is uh, shown on the film poster on the left here. Um, unless you have Bruce Willis to save the, uh, the Earth and its inhabitants, uh, an asteroid impact or uh, an impactor from um, from outer space is going to be relatively bad news for all of the things living on the Earth, not just those in the direct, uh, under the direct path of that impactor. So that's a, uh, a mechanism by which we may expect um, lots of things to die out within a relatively short time, and that would make it a mass extinction. We would also like to, I guess, identify that the level of extinction in a mass extinction event should stand out as considerably higher than the background extinction level, right? Otherwise, you may just be looking at a long period of elevated extinction. It's hard to define um, these terms any more precisely. First, because as I've mentioned already, each mass extinction seems to have been fairly unique, as we'll cover in the next video. But secondly, because it's sometimes hard to pin down the exact timing and scale of events. So there's got to be some slop in our definition. As you can see on this diagram on the right, there are a whole level of different um, levels, a whole level, <laughs> that's not what I mean, a whole number of different levels of extinction, right? So we've got ma really major ones. The biggest one was the um, PT, the Permo-Triassic extinction. Um, four slightly smaller but still very major ones, and then a large number of minor extinctions. You'll probably note, if you look at this diagram carefully, that extinctions normally coincide with the transitions between geological periods. You may want to have a think about why this may be, and if you, um, if you want to discuss this in the Zoom session, uh, we can happily do so, and in fact I may well set that as one of the questions that we discuss. Why do we have um, our geological time periods and extinctions aligning like this. So moving onwards, the advent of computers have revolutionized the world of paleontology, like all other areas of the human endeavor, I guess. And they've allowed us to create databases that are slightly larger and more expansive than that that Seb Kosky used for his work. And the general approach nowadays is for each species to have its first and its last appearances listed, and to do this for as many species as we possibly can. Many modern computer-based studies diagnose um, different events through the percentage of, extinct, of taxa that go extinct from interval to interval throughout the Phanerozoic, right? So looking at the subdivision, say, of the Ordovician, and looking between those two, how many of the things that were alive in the last interval are no longer alive in the current one. Make sense? Graph that as a histogram, and you get what you have on this slide here. On the basis of studies such as this, we can say that it is difficult to study mass extinctions in the Precambrian because we just don't have enough fossils to really get a clear idea of what's going on at this time. It has been suggested, I should note, that there may have been a Neoproterozoic event between the Ediacaran and the early Cambrian faunas. Seems likely there could have been a um, fairly significant extinction event during the Great Oxygenation event, when all of the things that were used to an anaerobic atmosphere were, were suddenly bombarded with oxygen. It's generally a bad thing if you're in that position. 
And when we graph um, a kind of like uh, the, the extinction of um, species across intervals such as this, once more we pick out these peaks that are marked with arrows that are our big five mass extinctions, but with a slimy, tiny bit of a caveat that I'll fill in in a minute. So based on these studies, we can say that the big five Phanerozoic mass extinctions occurred at the end of the Ordovician period, they occurred, one occurred at the late end of the Devonian period. This was quite a long one, actually. Um, there was a massive one at the end of the Permian period. There was a one at the end of the Triassic period. And then there was potentially the most famous one, but actually not the most severe one, that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period. We'll talk about these in um, later videos. Of those, the late Devonian and the end Triassic extinction events seem to have lasted, compared to the other ones, for a decent amount of time. And they may have involved, instead of um, lots and lots of extinctions, uh, depressed origination. Um, so you have, as you can see from this graph, um, evidence of some heightened extinction, but also if then there are not new species coming into existence, you still get an extinction, right? Hence, they don't appear as massive peaks here because there's that origination element to those extinctions as well as the extinctions that were happening to original species. I hope that makes sense. Because of that complexity in terms of um, these mass extinctions, a useful um, kind of um, division to make is between the proximal kill mechanisms these are the things that actually killed the organisms on the ground, such as change in temperature or a drought or something like that, and the ultimate kill mechanisms. So the ultimate kill mechanisms within this context would be the thing that's driving that drought or driving that temperature change. So if you have, for example, an asteroid impact and then a climate change, the proximal killers will be the um, the changes in temperature, the acid rain, all of those nasty things that life doesn't like, but the ultimate kill mechanism will still be that impactor. If that doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to think about it in terms of this horror movie screen, which I realized when I made these slides was um, recorded and released probably before the majority of you were born. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. It was one of the first meta horror movies and holds a special place in my heart as a result. In this movie, there is a killer, this person here, Ghostface, who goes around stabbing people with a knife. So in this movie, the proximal killer is stabbing. It's a, uh, it's a, a knife wound. However, if you ever watch the films, or ha if you have indeed watched the films, you will realize that the ultimate killer in these films is made out to be, at least in many of them, the effect that horror movies have on society. Yeah? So you've got that div division between the proximal and the ultimate kill mechanism, even within something like the screen movies. I'm not going to tell you any more about them in case you've not seen them because I don't want to give them away. So, as an example, two primary proximal killers in most extinctions are first, marine anoxia. So that's the first example of a proximal killer. The, this has been implicated in the early and middle Cambrian, in the late Ordovician, in the Silurian, Devonian, and Permian, and in uh, extinctions in the early Jurassic. Note that not all of those are mass extinctions, but we do know that marine anoxia, such as low, so low oxygen levels in oceans, are responsible for extinctions during all of those time periods. A modern example of this is shown on the image to the left. This is the 2017 Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone. It's an 8,800 square mile area um, of low oxygen levels that is the largest ever recorded in the Gulf of Mexico. In this particular case, it was caused by runoff of fertilizers that had been used to fertilize the soil in the US. That in turn fueled large algal blooms. Um, these algae are very, very successful. They live and then they die. When they die, they sink and decompose, and that depletes the water of oxygen. So this is the kind of um, chain of events that you can imagine quite easily happening over the course of geological time, uh, whether that be because 
humans are using fertilizers or because of changes in continental configuration or other extrinsic external factors impacting on Earth climates. So that's one primary proximal killer, one example of those few. A second example is global warming or cooling, so basically climate change and the effects that are associated with this. My example of this, shown on the right, is Blade Runner 2049. Um, it's clearly, uh, clearly a ratification has happened uh, at some point between 2020 and the advent of this movie in 2049, because as you can see, there's lots of dust in the atmosphere and it's very dry. So that's one example of climate change. Whilst those are two, I think, good examples that have been implicated in quite a few extinction events, other proximal killers include um, the acidification of oceans um, and acid rain, uh, ozone damage, and then the uh, increased UVB radiation that happens as a result of this, volcanic darkness that happens due to volcanic eruptions uh, and associated cooling and potentially even photosynthetic shutdown. If there's not enough life, primary producers can't photosynthesize. And each of those has been implicated in numerous different extinction events. These kind of proximal kill mechanisms that I've just introduced have been known for several decades, but I wanted to quickly highlight that more recent analytical work has identified other mechanisms that I suspect are quite surprising um, if you've never really thought about it. One example is toxic metal poisoning. Um, so for example, um, Mercury and concentrations thereof have been implicated recently in some uh, mass extinction events. And work nowadays, as well as exploring these proximal kill mechanisms, is actually looking at the biological effects of these kill mechanisms on the organisms that may have been alive at the time going extinct to see how that mechanism actually works. Once we've got life on land, so that's after the Silurian period, more about that in lecture nine or 10, I think 10. Um, but post that time period, once you have uh, life on land, uh, most crises, most extinctions affect both land-based and marine-based ecosystems. And this suggests that atmospheric processes were crucial in driving global extinctions because it's affecting both of those environments. So we know that a lot of these, um, these things that I've mentioned uh, kill organisms, right? That's not surprising. If, you're, if you breathe oxygen and there's not enough oxygen, you die. It's quite simple. What we have more trouble with in terms of mass extinctions is tying down the ultimate causes of these mass extinctions. Why, I hear you ask. Well, this brings us on to our important lesson. And that why question is well represented by this graph. So this graph shows the number of people who have drowned, I believe in the USA, by falling into a swimming pool with the number of films Nicolas Cage has appeared in, right? There is a significant uh, correlation between these two things. Yeah, these two variables are correlated. When the number of Nicolas Cage movies goes up, the number of people that drown in swimming pools also goes up. So those are correlated variables. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other, right? In order for there to be a causative relationship there, we would either have to come up with a mechanism by which Nicholas film cage, sorry, Nicholas film cages, uh, Nicholas cage films cause people to drown in a swimming pool, or a mechanism by which people drowning in a swimming pool cause more people to put Nicolas Cage in films, such as documentaries about these film, these uh, uh, pool deaths, for example, right? And I think most of us would agree there probably isn't a strong link between those two things, yeah? I wanted to give you one more example. Here's another strongly, uh, uh, strong correlation that I'm showing you here. This is the number of letters in the winning word of the Scripps National Spelling Bee in the USA correlated, which is co strongly correlated with the number of people killed by venomous spiders, right? Again, um, those two are correlated, but there doesn't have to be a causative relationship between the two. And indeed, unless we can come up with a mechanism linking those two, there probably isn't. So the lesson that I want you to take away from this 
is that correlation does not imply causation. Remember this in everything you do. This is why it's hard for us to um, pin down lots of the ultimate kill mechanisms when it comes to mass extinctions. So we can look at a whole load of correlated factors, but we don't know necessarily, in many cases, where the causative um, relationship is. So one of the obvious ways in which this, this correlation and causation things, thing gets very muddled up is when you have two variables that are strongly correlated that have a common cause. There is something underlying those two variables that dictates both their behavior. In this case, they're correlated, but there isn't a direct causative relationship between those two. So remember that correlation does not imply causation. It's very useful in uh, paleontology. It's very useful to identify in science. Also, it's useful to think about when looking at, for example, the news and trying to understand some of the things that are happening in the world, looking for correlations versus causes and whether, whether those things exist. And that's it for this video. So I will um, see you in the next one, shortly.